Um, good afternoon, magandang hapon or good morning, magandang umaga sa ating lahat to everyone. Welcome to our um, open space, uh, Just Minerals Transition in Asia and Europe. A central demand of climate movements has been moved has been to move to 100% renewal, renewable energy. Um, yet there is potential for widespread destruction and human rights abuses by the extraction of so-called transition minerals. A research has just been published by Warren Want, a material transition exploring supply and demand solutions for renewable energy minerals with case studies coming from Indonesia and the Philippines. This evening, morning, Based on this research, we will explore the so-called green extractivism and develop a deeper understanding of the initiatives needed to ensure just global supply chains for renewable energy technologies and address the fundamental societal change needed to reduce our unsustainable material consumption. I'm Judy Pasinio from LILAC. Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Rights, and also part of the Alianza Eagle Mina or the National Alliance Against Mining in the Philippines, where we are experiencing heat wave right now, or feels like a heat wave. And uh, with me is Anka Giorgio from London Mining Network, um, UK, where winter seems to be in a prolonged visit. So um, with us uh, this uh, today, we will have speakers from um, Philippines, Mai Takeban, and also from Indonesia, Pius Ginting, and from Sweden, Karina Gustafsson, and um, also to present uh, the report, we have Andy Whitmer from London Mining Network. Anka? Thank you very much, uh, Judy. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the sessions. Um, as my name is Anka Giorgio, and I'm a, a trustee for London Mining Network uh, based in uh, London, and we are one of the uh, co-organizers of this event. Uh, I just wanted to welcome everyone and to uh, let you know that uh, this webinar is organized in partnership with several organizations, uh, Action for Ecology and People Emancipation, um, based in Indonesia, uh, and they're working on phasing out fossil fuels and avoiding false solutions to climate change, Current, currently working with communities impacted by coal and nickel industry, and you will hear from them later today. Alianza Tijilmina is a coalition of organizations, groups, and communities who challenge the aggressive promotion of large-scale mining in the Philippines. London Mining Network, based in London, is an alliance of human rights, development, environmental and solidarity groups, and they hold London-based mining companies to account by uh, working closely with uh, mining affected communities, and they have recently started to increasingly coordinate action in solidarity with communities of, uh, affected by the demand of, uh, for minerals uh, necessary for a clean and energy transition. War on Want, uh, also based in London, uh, works to achieve a vision of a just world by fighting against the root causes of poverty and human rights violation, and they are part of a worldwide movement for global justice. Uh, alongside the Leap in Canada, they are uh, building a global Green New Deal strategy, which aims to coordinate different transitions and Green New Deal campaigns. And Yes to Life, No to Mining is a global solidarity no network of uh, and for communities, organizations, and networks advocating for the right to yes, uh, to say no to um, mining. And they amplify and support communities life-sustaining alternatives to mining as part of a global push for grassroots transitions towards post-extractivism. And finally, Global Justice Now is a social justice membership and campaign organization, which is working as a part of a global movement to challenge the powerful and create a more just and equal world. So, these are the organizers, uh, and we welcome everyone. Please uh, do use the uh, chat function, introduce yourself. We want to hear where you're coming from, um, which campaigns you're working on. And I will hand over now to uh, Judy. Uh, yes, uh, so I join Anka in encouraging everyone to please, let's have a, an active discussion through the chat, through the chat box. Please, as you introduce yourself, um, also, um, use the chat box for questions or um, contributions to the discussions, and we will be able to read them from time to time as we check the chat box. So for now, um, welcome 
Um, and Anka will now introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Judy. So uh, we have the uh, pleasure to have four presentations uh, today for the session. And we will start with uh, Mai Tagepa, uh, Takeban, apologies for the, uh, she's the executive director of Friends of the Earth Philippines. Um, so over to you, Mai. Thank you, Anka. Uh, let me just share screen. Am I being, uh, I think you need to allow me to share screen. Seems. Uh, Does it will you be able to? Yeah, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> uh, should, should I do? Should I share my yeah, screen? Can you, can you do it? I, I I could not see the. Maybe may may um my uh, uh host, yeah. co -host. Yeah, I I made her co-host now. Uh, ah, there it is. So so now she's co-host. All right. Let me try again. Ah, uh, it's still the same. Maybe we should, um, may I request you to uh, show the presentation that no, I've got? Can still, you try uh, it now again? Sorry. No worries. Ah, there you go. Yeah, okay. If not, I can do it. So. Okay, there you go. I hope everybody can see this. All right, let me begin then. Uh, very brief background. Well, this is just a few statistics on where the Philippines stands in terms of uh, nickel. Uh, the case study for the Philippines in this uh, anthology of case studies is it uh, focuses on nickel. Um, so there we go. Um, we're currently fifth largest in terms of reserves. Once we were number one, certainly not the kind of list we want to top. No? So in terms of the gamut of mineral resources in the Philippines, as you can see, 21% uh, of the mineral resources uh, would consist of nickel. Well, and this is the sort of uh, a timeline of the nickel production from 2006 to 2019. And you will see here how um, policy affects uh, uh, resource exploitation in terms of nickel. In 2016, the Aquino administration came down with Executive Order 79, which, um, uh, what do you call it? put a moratorium on new mining uh, agreements. No? So you see uh, scaling down. But by 2019, coming into the Duterte administration, we are beginning to see an increase as well. Historically, the nickel that is um, mined in the Philippines goes to Japan, no? 100% in 2014. But as you can see now, there's now a broadening of, of, uh, of, of markets for the nickel in the Philippines. You will see that I pasted below um, a website, no? Uh, Pandy Claim, it's actually an insurance company and they actually have a better listing of all the nickel uh, mining areas in the Philippines complete with photographs, etc. because they insure uh, cargoes in transit. And, and this is just to belabor the point that many of these resources do not stay in the Philippines but are actually exported. So I put here just so we have a better picture of the value chain or Sumitumo Metal uh, mining corporation is really the primary processing and smelting in the Philippines. They do this by high pressure acid leaching and they have their, um, their processing plants in, in two major areas, in Palawan, the last frontier of the Philippines, and also in Northern Mindanao, Surigao del Norte, which is kind of the heartland of nickel mining in the Philippines. And here again, to believe where this value chain or low grade is mixed with sulfide, and then it's sent to Japan, and it is in Japan where it is then properly manufactured uh, and then uh, distributed in the battery market. What's important to note in terms of uh, this transition and the conversation of transition is that they're now beginning to come up with press releases going into uh, just transition such as electric vehicles, et cetera. So Sumitomo has uh, been in partnership with Panasonic, Panasonic, on the other hand, is in partnership with Tesla and Toyota Motors for electric vehicles. Okay, so this is just to belabor that point. No, 2019, there was a proclamation by Sumitomo to increase its battery capacity. By 2020, the deal has been signed with, uh, with Toyota. Okay. Now I go to a case study you know, in, in the Philippines, in particular the case of Manikani Island. This is a, a Google Earth photograph of the mining site that is Manikani Island. You know. What is interesting about Manikani is that um, in 2002, the Department of Environmental uh, 
and natural resources actually ordered a stoppage of mining in the island. But to sort of circumvent that, the same department actually allowed uh, the mining corporation to ship ore from its stockpiles. No? And that it went on for over a decade, no? uh, notwithstanding uh, the local government of Samar uh, issuing an ordinance prohibiting large scale mining in the area. No? Uh, what has happened is that it has um, uh, resulted in internal conflicts. No? Uh, you have community members that were for and against mining. No? Uh, some of the things that happened was an anti-protestor, for example, anti-mining protestor, for example, was killed when a mining truck ran through a barricade uh, that they were they, that they conducted. Uh, two of the protesters, as well, in trying to stop company boats from delivering equipment, were injured. And support organizations that wanted to support um, community efforts were actually sued for libel. No. What is good about the, the good news about this, uh, the efforts there was that in 2017, the company failed to renew its, its MPSA or its mining agreement. No? But as you can see, Nickel Asia, which is the mother company of uh, the subsidiary mining corporation that's running in Eastern Samar, is not about to give up on it, no? saying that there's actually uh, a lot of ore that could still be developed. Moving forward, I take you to 2014, no? and this is how policy is supposed to dictate um, uh, our mineral uh, resource exploitation management. Uh, our president came very strongly you know, for the protection of uh, the environment, saying that this was actually non-negotiable. Uh, here, I want to picture, uh, this is Hinatuan Mining, also a part of Nickel Asia. It's uh, an island uh, that is almost ravaged by mining. No? And these were some of the reasons that the president was supposed to have seen. And so that's why he, he's coming hard on mining. Another one, this is also Karaskal Nickel Corporation. No? It's around the same area. And again, you can see the, the, the devastation in, in ecosystems. No? And here you see, it's almost like a menu that the MGB, the Minerals Bureau of, of the Philippines. No, it's, it's like a gamut of, of menu. Pick where you want to mine nickel in the Philippines. No? And again, coming on very strongly the following year, still uh, reiterating his, his uh, expect reforms, radical ones. But you know what is somewhat noticeable is that this uh, uh, double speak by the government, because in the same year that he said there will be radical policies, he would have his uh, alter ego, no? the department secretary of the DNR, suspending the ECCs, no? the environmental compliance certificates of some of this, uh, um, of some of this co corporations. What the department secretary did was actually uh, suspend the suspension no? in, and reiterated that this was in, uh, in the interest of service and in order to expedite the issuance of, of more regional mining. Fast forward to 2021, now the policy in the Philippines is that Duterte, the president, has lifted the ban on new mining agreements. So now there's, a, there's an opening. And you know, right as it, at its heels, you have uh, FTAAs left and right no, uh, being uh, considered by the government. This is couched by the government to generate rural jobs. Uh, Dominguez is our finance secretary. No? It's also... But I want to, to go back no, and belabor the point that in terms of industry contribution to the uh, GDP of the Philippine economy, this is less than 1%, 0.79. And if I could belabor, it's actually 0.79 no, for, for 2018, certainly not a, a good contributor to the economy. But here you can see the mining industry as well as the government couching it as a recovery program. No? Uh, to compensate for the needs of the country to answer for its uh, for the pandemic, no. Even the Philippine nickel industry is doubting that, and there's also they're also beginning to couch it as a climate crisis. Um, uh, what do you call this response, no? Both as a response to COVID and also cri climate crisis. Um, what's also rather insidious and makes. Uh, the what do you call this the landscape of resistance and protest and criticism in the Philippines is that we have other policies that tend to curtail uh, protest 
resistance of communities. Now the government's beginning to couch a certain uh, resistance as, as, as terrorism. We recently passed the anti-terror law. No? Uh, and so you have a lot of mining companies, uh, uh, residents for mining companies that are calling out the, the junking of this particular law. No? But if you look at the financial side, notwithstanding the closing of many businesses, filing a bankruptcy, uh, the mining sector in, in the Philippines continues to thrive. No? In fact, Nickel Asia Corporation is ranked as one of the more favored uh, investment corporations. No? In all this hardship, uh, Nickel Asia's uh, profit actually went up to 52%, no? notwithstanding the bad business climate. So here you'll see the projection. No? Now in 2021 going to 2025, there's certainly uh, the industry is seeing a lot of demand for nickel. And so it does want to open up uh, nickel mines more. No? So here I believe where this point, no? again, this is, uh, this is uh, Sumitomo and at the same time Nickel Asia Mining. No? This was taken in 2016. I tried to get a more updated Google map, but now if you look at it, they've all been covered. So the recent ones are blocked. You can't actually see it. And I end with this slide, no? that uh, the Philippine nickel miners are about to restart uh, Corona shuttered sites. So some of them closed because of lockdown protocols and now they are rearing to get on and mine. So that's it for me, Anka, thank you. Thank you very much, Mai. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mai. Um, yeah, um, you know, according to the report, a material transition, which we have, are, uh, which is the basis of this, uh, of this um, forum, um, cobalt, lith lithium, and nickel are the transition minerals that have been identified. And the report as well said that nickel has become an important metal in modern living, used in stainless steel and alloys, as well as electroplating and increasingly in rechargeable batteries, where it could potentially substitute for the more expensive cobalt. As in my presentation, we have seen no? um, the nickel mining in the Philippines. Um, it uh, affirmed the data that has been uh, included in the material transition report that 40% of global nickel reserves are located in protected areas with high biodiversity and 35% are found in areas with high water stress. 38% um, of global reserves are found in countries given an elevated warning or worse, on the fragile states index, while 54% are located in the states perceived to be corrupt or very corrupt on the corruption perceptions index. Indeed, nickel mining has been one of the triggers of conflicts, again, as has been shown by Mai in her presentation. In 2019, Indonesia was the world's largest producer of nickel. This afternoon, we also have Pius Ginting from Indonesia. Pius, along with Muhammad Rashdi, both from AEER or Action for Ecology and People Emancipation, contributed the case study of the nickel mining in Weda, Central Halmatera in Indonesia. So let's hear from Pius. Thank you, Can everyone Judy. see my screen? Apologies. Yes, uh, it's uh, good uh, from my screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, pardon if there is a noise, it is a praying time in Jakarta. Uh, so, uh, next. Yeah, uh, Indonesia uh, has uh, the biggest reserve of nickel uh, now, 25% of global reserve of the world. And uh, this is uh, located in the eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, three part of island is like uh, Dragon K. Uh, it is a Sulawesi island and the small K is Halmahera Island and Obi. So these three are the centers of nickel mining in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Uh, 
this uh, eastern part of Indonesia used to be called the Coral Triangle area. It's same with Philippines, Papua New Guinea. It, this is the sea that has a uh, sea most diverse of marine biodiversity. So there is this area called the Coral Triangle area. But uh, the problem is uh, when the nickel battery active in this area, the pollution to the marine will be increased because nickel processing produce paling, which is slurry. And now there is a plan to dump it into dumping it into the ocean. So the, this has become the first problem, tiling management. And the second problem is the intensive carbon emission from coal power plants, because so far, these three areas powered by coal power plants. So although it is, it has aimed to reduce emission by providing nickel batteries, but for the local communities, the pollution from coal power plant will be increased into their area. And the third problem is deforestation or habitat loss because like in Weda, the forest there is a protective forest grade quality, but now sacrifice for the nickel industries. And also in Morwali, it is in the forest area. Next. This. So this is the local community in Morwali, the fishermen. Uh, in their neighborhood now, there is the biggest nickel industries. We can see the boats very small. It is has long distance. If their coastal area damage, it will difficult for them to go further to the sea using this small boat. So they have a short distance for fishing. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is the from previous slide, the pictures of community uh, in the Kurisa. It is on our right side. Apologize for the background noise. And the nickel industries come very giant in uh, their neighborhood. And in the moment, their coastal become polluted and become hard to fishing, as particularly for older people, they cannot go as workers to the nickel mining companies. The younger can get employed, but for the workers after 50, 60 years, it's difficult for them to go to the industries. Next. Yeah, and this is the second area, Way the Bay area, which is uh, in the case study of the report that uh, mentioned by Judy. Uh, this the community here also live as a peasants and fishery folks, and the green, the blue. Uh, blue area is the centers of the nickel industries and community live uh, around, along the coastlines. Next. Slide, please. My next uh, slide is the forest area around the nickel industries. So it used to be as a protected forest, but 
since 1991, government uh, make possible for nickel mining in this forest. If uh, we read the report, material sensitive, uh, another report that only 35% of nickel can be recycled. So this is, I think it is quite small. So a lot of uh, forest will be need to be uh, cutting down for providing the nickel supplies later. If possible, we, we need 60 or almost 1% per, per uh, recycling. So the damage will not be uh, increased later in this uh, area. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next slide is uh, the few of the fillets uh, nearby the nickel mining in Weda, the Gemaf fillets, one, one of the fillets uh, located near area with its villagers go fishing with small boats, uh, woman and her husband. And with the small boat, we can see and if the this area become the location for the tailing uh, submarine tailing disposal, it will impact their living livelihood after the forest behind their village cutting down, so they cannot rely on the forest and also make it possible rely on the fishing. My next slide uh, tell about the impact of the coal power plants. IWIP, Indonesia Weda Industrial Park, will be supported by three times three, 2050 megawatts coal power plant by the end of 2020, and its capacity will be increased until 2000 megawatts, and it using 200 248,000 tons per day. And this creates air pollution and creates uh, along the nickel industries, uh, worsening the air quality in the neighborhoods. As we can see from the graph, the majority of illness is from upper respiratory infection. This is the most common illness related to the respiratory. Next. Yeah, if uh, further info, we produce beside the transition mineral, uh, we produce report fast and furious future, the dark side of nickel battery, and also wrote the report is in 2020, and there is also uh, documentary, but it is in the in Indonesia language. So let's uh, happy to talk later in the discussion. Offer to the Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Pius. Um, and it's good that uh, it's good to note that uh, we are joined by different comrades and uh, fellow activists from Pakistan, Philippines, Hong Kong, Belgium, Sweden, Indonesia, UK, and the Netherlands. So it's a real Asia-Europe people's uh, conversation tonight, and that's very good. Anka? Thank you very much, Judy, and, and thank you, uh, Pius and, and Mai, so far for the presentation. So we will move now uh, to Europe, and we are uh, honored to have uh, Karina Gustafsson with us today. She's the chairperson of the uh, Urgers Gruppen, uh, Grena Nora Carr. I hope I pronounced it well, uh, not really correctly, but uh, in English will be the Bedrock Group. Uh, she was born and raised by Lake Vatern in Sweden, and now she fights to protect the lake against a proposed RE, uh, EI, um, RE mining industry close to the shores of the lake. Over to you, uh, Karina, and I will uh, share the screen for your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Karina. 
Gustafsson and I am based in the south middle part of Sweden. I'm happy and grateful to be with you today and it feels good to hear uh, all of you speak. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, but yes, we, uh, go back from, to the from, yeah, beginning. <laughs> Yeah. Um. yeah. Yes, I was born and raised by a large freshwater lake in Sweden called Lake Vessel. And my family has lived by this lake um, for as long back in time as you know, as I know. Um, my grandmother was born on the little island that you can see there. Uh, in the middle of the lake, called Wissingsö. Um, I owe my life to this lake. Um, without the lake, I wouldn't be here, because it has sustained my family for many, many generations. Um, there has always been a magic sense within this lake. Um, it is very beautiful and, tran and tranquil, but it can also be very um, unpredictable and strong and wild. So we were taught to always respect the lake. The water in the lake is spring water. It's fed by underground springs and it's crystal clear and you can drink the water without any treatment and today it provides drinking water to uh, up to 500,000 people. Now we can change the picture, the photo please. Here we have a look out over the lake uh, with a, an old castle ruin uh, from an old castle ruin called Brahehus. And it lies on 120 meters height above the lake. This is very close to where a Canadian company wanted to place a large REE mining industry. And you, we can take the next picture. And now we have taken the ferry from the small town Grana uh, over to the island where my grandmother from and it's called Wissing Sea. Um, to the right you can see what's left of an old castle from the 1560s um, close to the harbor. And we can take the next. This is a site that would meet us when we set foot on the island in the harbor. Um, Horse and carriages are still being operated during the summer months. Uh, it was a way for the local farmers to earn some extra money in the summertime because a lot of tourists come to this lake and this area. Uh, approximately every year, 700,000 people. And <clears throat> during the recent Corona years, the, the numbers are even higher. So we can take the next. Yeah. <clears throat> People and living beings have lived in this area depending upon Lake Western since time immemorial. There are many legends and mythic tales surrounding this lake that have been loved and lived with for such a long time. Here you can see a sculpture of um, one creature from the myths, that's giant Vist. He threw a patch of land out into the lake to help his wife cross over the lake when they had been to a feast on the west side. That's the legend on how the island Vissingsö came to. We can take next please. And here we have a couple of the many species of fish that live in the lake. And you can see how clear the water is. 
these kinds of fishes uh, you find way up north in Sweden, in the cold mountain streams. So because of this lake being very uh, deep, it's 120 meters at the deepest point. Uh, it, the water down by the bottom stays very cold, so it's ideal um, habitats for this kind, these kinds of fishes, that are very delicious, by the way. I grew up eating fishes from this lake. Okay, we can take the next picture. You may know uh, Sweden it has a long history of being a mining uh, country. And, uh, the mining has been done mostly up north in Samika people's country. And this is uh, a couple of pictures that taken up north at the copper mine called Aitik. And you can see the large pit uh, and uh, also the large tailings pond that this copper mine produ have produced. And this mine is approximately the size that the REE mine is, that's being proposed close to Lake Vatten. Yeah, we can take the next picture. And here's a map of, uh, the blue is the lake and the red circle there is the mine site that they are proposed to put there. So you can see that it's very close to the shoreline and uh, as you, if you remember the castle ruin, you can also see that it's a very steep shoreline. So everything that happens on top is uh, predestined to run down <laughs> into the lake. Yes, we can take the next. So this makes us very uh, worried indeed, uh, this kind of mining industry that is very toxic and uh, also the rare earth man minerals often uh, exist in the bedrock together with radioactive materials. So it's kind of unthinkable to us uh, this project because it will probably, well, ha the high probability that it would destroy the lake and also, I mean, the drinking water for so many people. And uh, the lake itself is, is connected to many aquifers around the lake for groundwater. So there's a lot of people living in this area that could be affected. So it's kind of a large area. So this picture is from, <clears throat> that was from a mining industry in China. We can take the next. And here you have a photo from uh, the lamp power plant, uh, um, the lamp plant in uh, Malaysia um, that was built in 2012. Uh, it belongs to Linus Corporation in Australia and it uh, has been in operation since 2012. And since then, in 2019, they had produced 450,000 tons of radioactive waste that they have stored in this site in Malaysia, Kuantan. It has created a lot of problems for the people who live there, and they have successfully campaigned to try to get Linus to clean up and hopefully move away from, from this site. Um, Linus Corporation ship their um, ore or concentrate of uh, rare earths from their mine in Mount Weld, Australia, to Malaysia. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of fossil fuels are being used in this process. It is very energy intensive. So let's take next, or the last picture here. What, but we use these minerals, of course, in our computers and in our cell phones 
and in electric vehicles. Uh, so we have a problem. Um, how do we handle this situation that we are in with climate change and everything? Well, for once, uh, rare earths are also used to a large extent in the weapons industry. And uh, we also have an opportunity uh, to extract rare earths from old mine tailings. We have a lot of mining waste laying around in many places that could contain rare earths. So there's a project on the way in Sweden trying to extract rare earths from <clears throat> the old mines up in Kiruna in, in the north. And also today, uh, I think it's 0.1% of rare earths that are being recycled. So there's a lot of wasting going on uh, that needs to change. So we should reduce, recycle and reuse uh, these minerals and really be careful with how we use natural resources because every everything requires raw materials. So we have to think before we act and use a lot and not waste uh, the resources. And Lake Vesten has been the source of life in this area of the country since time immemorial. And we will not allow anyone to destroy this precious freshwater lake. Two or three percent of all the water in the world is fresh water. And we are quite aware that not everybody is as fortunate as we are to have clean drinking water. So we have to protect this lake uh, for future generations. And uh, we will fight. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina, for the positive. Yeah, thank you, Karina. Um, wow, and, and that's a beautiful lake you have there. Um, and, you know, we have in the audience here people from um, women from um, the Philippines um, in mining air, affected area. And water really has uh, become a very critical, critical yeah. um resource that is being endangered by, by the mine. And so yeah, there's a lot of solidarity here that uh, um, that can be made in connections to Thank further you. our our struggle for clean waters. Um, in the chat box you would see um, there's a message here for, from Sundara Babu Naga sorry Sundara Babu saying, thank you so much. Um, never knew of mining issues in Sweden. Um, and also from WIP, thanks so much, Karina. Great to make the connection to Linus in Malaysia too. Um, and solidarity from Pakistan. Yes. Thank you so much, um, everybody, for that. And of course, I'm devastated to hear about the situations both in Malaysia and in Indo Indonesia that it's not acceptable to destroy so much of land and air and water. Not acceptable. It's supposed to be green transition. I don't think it's very green. Yeah, and that's uh, what the report is all about to expose yeah. uh, um, the fallacy of green transition that is being touted now. Mm -hmm. But before we go into the details of the report, we would like to encourage everyone to um, to raise their own questions or their own experiences or their contributions to the discussion. We have also been joined by our colleagues from um, Germany and Australia. Welcome to the discussion. So, um, you can actually turn on your mic uh, if you have questions, but of course you raise your hand first so we can uh, acknowledge you. Either questions or contributions, um, please feel free. Um, but for now, uh, we move 
to Andy Whitmore, uh, one of the instigators <laughs> of this report from London Mining Network, uh, a the report on the material transition. And for sure, we will share the link later so that you can see the entire report and also the case studies uh, by uh, from the Philippines and from Indonesia. So with, um, we have heard the, the sharings from uh, Indonesia, from Philippines and Sweden. Um, maybe you can share what, what's the urgency that the research and material transition aims to respond to? Um, and what, what, what are your main findings in the research? It would be good to share them and share your insights thereafter. With. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Judy. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you, everyone. Um, so, as mentioned, my name is Andy Whitmore, known as Wit, so you'll hear, hear me addressed as both. Um, but feel free to call me Wit uh, from the London Mining Network and author of this report. And uh, apologies, I've only just come in slightly late. So, Anchor, if you could do my slides, that would be good. I had a kind of emergency doctor's appointment. So, I was due to speak first, but I'm actually really glad having heard everyone else speak. So I think the idea was I was going to do an introduction. But now, having heard the strength and, and passion in, in the three different presentations, I think it's quite good to kind of come in afterwards and try and link them together and answer some of those questions, including yours, Judy. I think in a way, the presentations have kind of given some of the clue towards where the urgency is of this. Um, I mean, it's interesting that in the case of the Philippines, we're talking about a historical nickel mining that's been going on for some time but also you know the potential increase and the fact that the um, companies themselves are saying that the the increase in mining is because of climate change and because of the recovery um, and clearly you know that's what's uh, also been talked about in terms of spurring both uh, nickel mining in Indonesia which has clearly been talked about for, for batteries and I'm glad we weren't just concentrating on batteries, but also yeah, the rare earth elements, which are essential as well, that Karina was talking about. So, so I think it's great that we've been able to, to you know, switch between um, Asia and Europe and show the different uh, issues. But I think the real you know, potential there is just horrifying. I mean, the last time we had a super cycle, which is a kind of a, a continual set of booms happening, was when it was feeding the, the sort of industrial growth of China. It was growing at sort of nine, eight, nine percent at this horrifyingly large terms in terms of the uh, resources it was using. And so far, the industry is pretty much talking about exactly the same thing happen, happening now, being driven with by climate, the, the response to the climate change and by the potential recovery from COVID-19. So, you know, there is massive urgency there. It's so perhaps if I could move on to the next slide then. So that was why we, we decided to do the report. And I hope that Seb, who was potentially standing in for me if I didn't make it in time, will post a link to the report for you to look at. But you know, why did we want to do the report? Well, I think this slide kind of shows what we see as the potential problems here. So, slide on the right hand side you've got annual co2 emissions rising and you've got uh, um, energy consumption rising in the bottom right as well pretty much matching each other you know over a hundred years clearly you know we have a climate crisis clearly we need to address this but i think for us the slide that's interesting the part of its slide is on the left and here you've got um, consumption of metals particularly steel copper and zinc over the last, it's a different time scale. It's, it's about 50 years from 1960 to 2010. You can clearly see that they're, they're tripling, basically. And these are these are minerals that have, I'm sure many of us here who work in solidarity know they have huge environmental footprints, you know, and they clearly contribute to climate change. I mean, you have uh, all used in steel making, but also, you know, they're contributing to the biodiversity and environmental crises, to land theft from peoples, to human rights abuses. So I think for us, the thing we need to concentrate on is not just the climate crisis, but the fact that since 1970, our resource, natural resource uses have tripled, and that's likely to continue even though we live in planetary boundaries. Okay, so next slide, please. So if that that those levels are increasing we have those 
production levels going up, we have a fundamental problem in itself. That is the problem. So the short form of this we call is extractivism, this idea of, of you know, wholesale extraction of common ecological goods. And therefore, I would argue that we're not in a climate crisis. We're not just in an energy crisis. And therefore, we don't just need an energy transition. We're in a crisis of using materials. And therefore, what we have is what we need is a materials transition. We need to think about everything that we're doing, which kind of goes back to um, particularly the point that Green have finished on as well. So it's not to say we shouldn't tackle fossil fuel crisis. I mean, we clearly need to stop using fossil fuel. I mean, we can't just dig our way out of the climate crisis. And it's interesting that, you know, the main people who are promoting this very much seem to be mining companies and those who are investing in them they've kind of become the new heroes of the energy transition so this this new boom that i talked about I mean, it's it's been described by a mining entrepreneur robert friedland as the revenge of the miners which is kind of scary when you for those of us who've been working on mining to think what it's going to be like if they now get their revenge yeah you know, they're they this is basically in termed as a back to green and moving fossil fuel to green transition and because of that i think they're using it very much to kind of greenwash themselves so i think our biggest problem is that you know that they're effectively saying that they are going to be the uh saviors of this and you know, they never talk about the fact that so many of the minerals are used in other goods you know including military purposes um so i think we need to kind of consider the whole use and not just any that's going to be used towards the climate change also, I think what we've got is a kind of a new mining frontier, one that, that we call green extractivism, which is the idea that basically human rights and ecosystems in certain areas are going to be sacrificed in order to solve climate crisis. So next slide. Just briefly to talk about what uh, minerals we're going to be talking about. I mean, we use the term transition minerals, though sometimes people talk about uh, physical minerals, etc. I mean, transition minerals are basically those that are being used for the energy transition. I think they come in three types. First is those that are actually used for renewable energy hardware, so solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal plants. And in a way, I mean, most of the, they're less talked about, but actually that's probably in volume the biggest amount. It's a, a three megawatt wind turbine uses about 335 tonnes of steel five tonnes of copper, three tonnes of aluminium, and up to two tonnes of rare earth element, which is kind of scary when you consider the amount of waste that's produced, you know, the amount of ore that's used in comparison to what's dug up, and then the amount of wind turbines we need, and you begin to see the scale of why the urgency is there. And the second is, is batteries for storage, and clearly we've been talking about that with nickel, where we, we have lithium ion batteries that are using cobalt and nickel on the cathode side, as well as, uh, as well as lithium and they you know, clearly the growth in these is going to be big but they're probably starting from from a lesser amount so you know they're obviously of importance it is also worth bearing in mind the complete volumes i think what's you know what's going to be interesting is is the technology on batteries is moving so quickly you know that we may be i think we were talking about uh, cobalt being replaced by nickel already you know, just I think in the space since we've written the report and it's been published, they're now talking much more about moving over to uh, to iron phosphate. So effectively, you will have trees of cathodes that are made of iron. So it will have its own impacts, but slightly different. So we just need to be aware they're shifting. And then the final part is um, uh, uh, minerals that we use for increased transmission infrastructure. So that's primarily copper. Again, you know, it's a whole bunch of different minerals. So all, put all that together, you're talking about the World Bank estimate of about 3 billion tonnes of metals and minerals that we needed for the renewable transition. Okay, next slide. So where are these impacts going to be? Um, so this is a uh, slide from um, uh, the report. Basically, this is an attempt to kind of show where this new green extractivism is going to go. And basically, you know, the same areas are likely to be the ones that have been targeted in the past. So we're talking about the global south, we're talking about areas of, of Asia, etc. Um, and particularly on indigenous land, and some of that's within the global north as well. So uh, some of that can be in the US, Canada, Australia, etc. Um, 
I think what's particularly interesting if we look at this from an Asia Europe perspective is that we've you know, we've got the two case studies from the Philippines and Indonesia. We've got massive mining coming out of of uh, China. But at the same time, we've also got this shift back to kind of the old world, which I think Brina has talked to. And so we've got potential for lithium mining in Spain and Portugal. Serbia, we've got the rare earths we've talked about in Sweden. You know, there's, a, there's a whole host of different case studies we could have shown to show how there's likely to be you know, re, uh, reigniting uh, mining interests in Europe. And I think that's a really interesting opportunity for us in terms of being able to have that, that new solidarity between Europe and, uh, and Asia. Okay, so next slide. So then the, the uh, next three and almost last slides are just concentrated on the three main messages from the report so the first message is basically about communities who are in resistance so it's basically about that solidarity i mean communities are themselves fighting to protect the local environment and their way of life and i think what's interesting to me is the fact that many of those communities are the ones that can actually show us the way in terms of less consumption etc you know how to transform our energy intensive societies into one that are more democratic and fair so use the example of sort of latin american indigenous term for buen vivir which is basically living well but that applies equally to my experience of indigenous communities in the philippines so all, we have all of these local movements which are resisting extraction and i think increasingly coming together in solidarity both within the region now across region so i think our first act is global solidarity working to support communities or in risk resistance is for their free to um, ensure their free for informed consent or increasingly their right to say no okay, next slide and we also looked at um, possible solutions around what we call supply side solutions. So really what we're talking about here is the idea of looking at uh, due diligence along the supply chains. So the report has a number of tables, uh, I think over six pages that kind of look at these different potential mix of binding laws, regulatory framework, et cetera. I think the fact we stretch over six pages shows the sheer number of these laws and schemes you know, really requires consolidation and coordination because there's just so many, it's just almost confusing. Um, so in order to do that, I think suppliers and manufacturers have got to, to work with companies and governments, but particularly with civil society, particularly with impacted communities. So we should be feeding in to ensure that they're effective and legitimate. But I think more importantly than that, we also have to ensure that there's mandatory compliance. A lot of these schemes are voluntary, and clearly that's just not good enough. So I think we need to uh, yeah, address the uh, lack of effective and binding mechanisms for, uh, for respect for human rights, and particularly holding transnational corporations to account. Some of that is through, um, for instance, the, the activities that go on globally for um a binding treaty on human rights and some of it is within europe at the moment where you have uh, europe it's uh, european law that's been proposed around due diligence okay um yep yeah, next slide then the third and final area is around demand side solutions but this is about our own cons consumption so some of this is about personal choice I think the key thing to note is that it's not really just about individual choices. I think it's very easy to get just um, sidetracked into what the journalist George Monbiot calls uh, micro-consumerist bollocks or micro-consumerist rubbish. I don't know if that kind of translates very well, that phrase, but basically this idea that we're kind of getting distracted over our choice of cotton buds away from the big issues. So yeah, we need system structural change. We've got to be ambitious, and a lot of this has got to lead to what we call a circular economy, which again kind of goes back to what Karina was saying, this idea that we need to be able to reduce uh, our resource use as much as possible through you know, reusing, through ensuring that goods last as long as possible, repurposing, and all the way down to recycling as the last option when, uh, when we can't do all those other things. I think for us, one of the key lessons of the report is it's not just enough to do this switch, but still have green growth. But you can uh, basically, it's not just about swapping to electric vehicles, one, one internal combustion vehicle for one electric vehicle and still producing more and more of them. 
we really need a, a radical re reduction of our unsustainable consumption. And such a change, as far as we're concerned, as far as I'm concerned, we could call it a circular society. So next slide. And I think this is really interesting because you know, the fact that we call it the circular economy means it's going, we're just focusing on it all being economic, but this is not all about economy. You know, you can create this, this closed loop economy, so to speak, which is green, um, unless you start considering planetary boundaries, unless you start considering um, ideas like you know, wealth, power, technology. So you're considering how things are owned, I mentioned that not just swapping one car, you know, you actually have to look at public transport, you have to look at ways that we can uh, um, improve our lifestyles without necessarily going for economic growth. And for, for me, when I found this term that an academic had written, and I think it really sums up beautifully, you know, this idea of having a circular society where all of those things are considered and all of those things are, are factored into what's, what's effectively circular. Uh, next slide. So, and the conclusions so basically this is a reiteration of what i'm saying but what we really need is a global effort in this case we can say interregional effort between europe and asia to bring together those uh, who are really at the heart of transition minerals so that's basically international solidarity with those most impacted by transition minerals ensuring that we advance in initiatives to ensure fair and just global supply chains importantly and i think this is something we as mining campaigners haven't looked at, you know, linking with other people who are looking at fundamental societal change to reduce our unsustainable consumption. So it's, I think that's a challenge for us to move out of our kind of ghetto. And that's why being in part of a broad discussion at the AEPF is really, really useful. And I hope we can feed into that. And then my final kind of goodbye slide <laughs> is to say thank you very much. There's a, a beautiful kind of um, a beautiful just. Uh, diagram that's in the report um it's produced by nat lowry that kind of shows how we can move towards this sort of post extract transition also just to end on a positive note um i'm mean, thinking of, of europeans uh, members of the european parliament have recently voted to push for legal legally pending targets to reduce resource use by 2030 and to bring eu consumption within planetary boundaries by 2050 so you know those sorts of moves are happening. You know I could I could give other examples. They're very much on the the left field at the moment. They're you know they're just starting. I think there is a whole movement that we need to be as part of the vanguard on you know, pushing forwards to make sure that um, we can make changes across the whole globe, but particularly in Europe, or release the pressure on mines affected communities. I look forward to asking further about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. With uh, thank you for such a powerful, coherent, and clear presentations. And for those of you who haven't uh, seen the report, I would encourage you just to officially congratulate Wait and and Warawant and London Mining Network because I know it was a titanic work and research going on. And it's great to see that besides the the information that is there, uh, there are case studies, and and still we're working in solidarity and echoing the voices of the frontline communities fighting. Um, and uh, again, yeah, congratulations with and, and yes. uh, hopefully everyone uh, can see the and I will invite you to read the report. Um, we are, uh, you know, there are so many reflections and so much information that Pete has presented and some of these things we will explore. Uh, and how do we imagine actually a post extractive world and what do we need to consider? And I think Wit has done so beautifully in this transition of uh, what the problem is uh what the communities uh and and the fights of the communities and then the solutions um and also you know um this vision that we need to create i will uh i don't want to uh um take too much of the time but we will invite you now we have uh, some time for uh questions also from for reflections uh and i've just seen that the a hand was raised already i think it was jb so uh, thank you for joining us, JB. And uh, if you, I don't know if you have a question for the speakers or uh, something that you would like to share. Yeah, JB, you can unmute. Uh, yes, for everyone to know, we will invite you to speak and you can directly speak or you can post the questions in the chat and we will monitor them and, and we can. Uh... While JB is trying to find out how to unmute himself. Um, JB Garganera is from the Alianza Tigilmina, is the national coordinator, and he's one of the co 
writers of the case study in the Philippines. So, Jamie, there is no option to unmute. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but uh, I don't know. My screen is acting up. I'm seeing the question right on top of the participant. So I, I can't unclick anyone at the moment. Let me, let me, um, um, can you do that? Anka. Yes, I will try now. Yeah. Uh, I could not see anything with this. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presenters and to wait for the chairing. You know, I, I, I've read the draft several weeks ago and certainly it's a refreshing input when, when the, ca the cases are presented in that way and also that summary. I had the question in the chat box, maybe later on our panelists can can put some of their thoughts on that question. But I, I just listening in the past hour, I, I, I would like to share three points. Um, one, on the rare earth minerals. Now, very few mining host countries, including, I bet, Philippines, Indonesia, and and even some of the Latin American countries, very few mining host countries have the capacity to determine, measure, and account for the presence and flow of these rare earth minerals. Now, it may be tempting to say that a critical next step would be to accept the offer of UN agencies or China or Canada to do more geologic baseline and exploration of rare earth minerals in our countries. But this is a catch-22 situation for us because expanding on, on this geologic baseline and exploration would potentially bring more investors and miners to come and do more mining. Uh, on the other hand, do we want to remain in the dark about this? Because you know, China will always get barges and barges of, of raw minerals practically rocks and soil from the Philippines without us knowing uh, what kind of rare earth are, are, are in those that have been exported. So that's the first one. You know, second, I'm, I'm really glad that with this Asia Euro People's Forum, we are having this conversation about materials transition. But I think we need to extend this conversation with our climate justice counterparts. You know, DCJ and uh, CAN Global Networks have already started exploring this topic. And I think this report by Warren Want, London Mining Network, and YLNM, this is an excellent starting point for us to deepen and widen that conversation with our climate justice counterparts. Um, we as campaigners and advocates and, and supporters of affected mining communities, we should be able to contribute in that platform of conversation during the COPs and, 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 and especially when our data and information like in this report can be useful and relevant to the climate negotiations because uh, I don't think they will see more mining of lithium, cobalt, and nickel as a potential issue because from, from the perspective of the green economy, it is necessary to get more minerals. But it begs the question from us, at what cost? And, and I think this is where the, the report and the book is coming. These are the costs if we proceed with, uh, without any mitigating assessment about the impact of this mining. Finally, maybe half a minute, about this, this option of moving towards a circular economy. It's, that was an excellent diagram uh, we presented. Now, we know that the Bretton Woods Institution, World Bank particularly, are gearing up to calibrate their investment for portfolios in, into what they call climate smart mining. The, the briefing paper on this one is, is at least about two years old already from the World Bank. Now, last week, Elon Musk of Tesla said they are reducing their interest to use Bitcoin because of the climate footprint of Bitcoin. However, he seems to be blind about the climate footprint of, of electronic vehicles and the huge demand for batteries of his electronic vehicles. So there must be a way 
for us environmental groups and climate justice activists that we can influence the the, the electric vehicles industry and the solar industry and their financial Jamie, did we lose you? Hello. Yes, you're back. Yeah, I think my last sentence was, uh, I think we should be able to find some way for us as environmentalists and climate justice activists to influence the electronic vehicle industry and the solar industry and their financial investors to take a more serious look at the impacts of transition minerals. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, JV. Uh, indeed, this report has triggered a lot of um, questions, but also a lot of that, um, how do you say, it has taken us to a certain direction where we can uh, be more critical, but also uh, direction to forge deeper solidarity with the different movements, particularly the climate justice. And so, so yeah, thank you for that intervention. Um, he has actually posted questions about uh, which um, questions which uh, he's posing to the speakers. Are the researchers, authors aware of any initiative by the UN or the Bretton Woods? groups to start discussing the circular economy, much less, of course, the proposed circular society. Or he has mentioned this a bit, but maybe we can get the reaction from, from our um, guests here. From my views, Karina and Whit. Happy to go first, unless anyone else wants to. And maybe if I, I'll try to quickly respond to some of JV's points, which are really good as well. Um, so on the point about rare earths, he meant, I mean, just to stress, sometimes people confuse rare earths with transition minerals. They're a very specific kind of part of it. I think what's interesting is that, they, you know, they're, they're not particularly rare. I mean, the reason that China has, has got such a, a large part of the market is because the mining, but particularly the processing of them, you know, is very, very environmentally destructive. And China for a while was willing to accept that. I think one of the interesting things that most people don't know is that that's, they've actually been cleaning up their rare earth uh, mining, which is one of the reasons that um, the people are strategically looking at doing it, but also because they've cut down the amount they're doing, but also they've exported a lot of it to Myanmar. So actually Myanmar is, is at the moment um, exporting about 50% or Chinese are imported about 50% of their rare earths from Myanmar. So it's shifting to places where, you know, in theory, there's the, there's less regulation, etc. cetera. Um, so you know, I would be really worried about um, too much of uh, rare earth uh, element um, exploration being done, et cetera. Because again, you, know, you really have to consider just how um, potentially damaging it is. Um, and also that point about knowing what's uh, what's in there as well is really important. One of the points that's highlighted in the report is the issue that the Bolivians are exporting tin and the refiners are actually refining indium out of it. But because they've only paid for the tin, the international companies that are refining are keeping all the money for indium uh, that comes from indium. So it's really to know you know what's actually being produced where it's going when it gets shipped out basically you know there are uh, countries that are losing out in that and absolutely about the climate justice counterparts i mean that's one of the reasons we wrote the report is we really want to be working with um because there's the potential to divide different communities that are making calls so we that's in some ways that strong message we want about material transition considering the impacts of everything you know i think will bring us together um, and so then the last points on the circular society, yeah, I think, you know, BB in a way has talked about that. I, I think there are, there are definitely parts of the UN, there are quite a few different independent bodies that are promoting the circular society. Um, it's interesting that climate smart mining hasn't particularly um, focused on it. The, the, the World Bank's produced two reports after stinging criticism from civil society, they've actually introduced recycling into the second report 
it's interesting they introduced recycling, which I mentioned. I think recycling is one of the, it's almost like the end thing. You don't want to be recycling. What you want to do is, is extending the life, reusing. You know, it's basically recycling is still energy intensive. So if, if everyone thinks that the circular society is about recycling, then they're, you know, they're, they're fucking completely up the wrong tree. Therefore, I would say the World Bank who partly want to promote mining are fucking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I think yeah, they at the moment. You know, I'm more worried in a way that organisations like the UN or the World Bank come in because they're just not looking at it from the right angle. They're not starting from that absolutist point of view of just how we live better by reduced materials. Thank you very much. Rick. Uh, so we uh, we still have a couple of minutes uh, for. Uh, uh, questions. Uh, if somebody would like to have a, um, an intervention, again, we can. Uh, you can unmute, unmute yourself or post a question in the chat. Uh, and then at the end, we want to uh, end on on some reflective questions and some and some final um, interventions from the speakers. So uh, again, I, I invite you if you have any questions or interventions, or if I miss something in the chat, you can raise your uh, hand. Or let us know if you want to be unmuted. Okay. Yeah, Pius, go ahead. Yeah, meanwhile, waiting for other questions. So, uh, we aware about the statement of the Elon Musk about the need for the nickel that uh, environment friendly. So his statement he will give big contracts for the nickel that environment friendly so one thing uh, this is good like issues of uh, submarine tiling disposal should not be categorized as environmental friendly because it creates problem with our marine so and also using coal power plants should be avoided uh, like what happened right now in the nickel industries but uh, we have limit of our natural resources capacity because uh, weather located in the Halmahera it is small island uh, community indigenous people even until now they live in the nomadic lifestyle there it will be a problem for them uh, we need to stop before too late uh, for them to be extinct we afraid they are to be extinct because their lifestyle of uh, nomadic uh, will be disturbed by this uh, uh, kind of by the expansion of uh, uh, nickel mining so uh, one way to achieve the uh, beside uh, to, to achieve the environmental nickel mining is also to uh, use less whether it is through extension of life cycle or through uh, through uh, recycles because uh, uh, in the Indonesia it cannot uh, uh, it will be problematic for the locals uh, uh, communities so we need to push more about reduce using less yeah I am there Thank you very much, Pius. Uh, I know Cori uh, uh, Karina needs to leave, so we were uh, planning to explore a few questions. Uh, what are the solutions to the problems described? Uh, what does a, a post-extractive world look like? And what changes are necessary for us to transition? Uh, to transition, and also what changes uh, we don't want to see happen. So, Karina, uh, because you're about to leave and you have to leave, would you like to? Um,
let's see. Sorry, I I wasn't really <laughs> uh, hearing what you said. Sorry, no, we we, uh, we were just saying if you have any any reflections, and we were we were uh, just um, we wanted to end on on some questions, reflection questions. So, um, what changes do we want to see, or how do we build a collective, and and how do we show solidarity, and what does a post-destructive world would look like, or anything you would like to? Uh... That's that's. Uh... Hundred thousand dollar questions, I guess. <laughs> well, I would like to see a society or people should remember our responsibilities here on Earth. We are here to take care of the Earth and to live in balance with the natural world. And uh, we are dependent upon the natural world for our livelihoods also. So I've worked a lot with indigenous peoples over the years and uh, one of their teachings is that we shouldn't take more than we need. And uh, that's something we should could also have uh, take with us. And we need another kind of society uh, that's based on the regenerative process of nature. So, the ideal would be, uh, we have taken so much already out of the earth. And I think we have to um, both be more careful of how we use the resources and uh, reuse and recycle more. But we also have to reduce our uh, consumption and find a better way <laughs> of life. And uh, a reminder to everyone is that water is the very foundation for life. Without water, we don't have a life. So that's really important to me to remember. Yes. Thank you very much, Karina. Um, and thank you for bring, bringing the different. Uh, there is a, a question from Marianne in, uh, in the Q&A. Judy, would you like to? Yeah. Um, yeah, the question here is which would be the best and fast way to strengthen local communities? They cannot wait until a new economy has been built. Who would like to go first with that question? So while waiting for that new economy, that new circular, circular economy that we're uh, trying to build, what's the best and fast way to strengthen local communities, especially in the face of all of these threats? Who would like to go first? Um, Karina, yeah. Karina. <laughs> Saying bye bye because I have to go. Oh, to work. <laughs> okay, yeah. Karina, thank you so much for spending time with us. We hope, I to hope see we you will, again. We will see each other soon again, hopefully. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. And you take care. care. Thank bye. you, Karina. Yeah. Should I go for that then? And unless go anyone with. else wants to come in, I'll just quickly say, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a good question. I think one of the interesting um, situations in a lot of the communities who are in resistance to mining is one of the essential areas that they look at is kind of the financial alternatives, um, how they can um, expand what they're already doing in terms of sustainable economies. Oddly enough, I think there's probably better examples of this in Latin America. Certainly a lot of the communities in, um, uh, for instance, Cajamarca in Colombia, you know, have, have um, focused on their local produce, et cetera. So they're, they're looking at how they can um, create that sort of their own sustainable economy, which is a, uh, a form of resistance in a way to the mining. But I think in, in you know, that would be my first point. And the other one is that Again, I mean, it's so difficult. I mean, it's difficult for me to answer this because I you know, work in solidarity. I'm not in a community, but my experience is that those who are in communities, you know, again, one of the first things is to try and get as much cohesion as possible because um, 
just the arrival of extractive industries from the outside tends to, to bring conflict. So yeah, the more that can be done to, to ensure that communities are working together to, to foster kind of equal um, equal opportunities within the community, but sort of democratic processes, I think that's really important. I may have got a slightly different uh, angle on what the question was asking for, but I hope that would be my, my initial thoughts. Thank you, Wit. Maybe Mai can um, follow suit. Um, how do you say? I think it's very important that we're able to amplify community voices. Karina spoke about this. There's much to learn from communities in terms of um, what kind of scale are we talking about in this transition? Um, uh, what is a just transition, for example? No? These are ideas and notions that we can learn from communities. But as in the report in the Philippines, no, in, the power imbalance is a challenge, remains a challenge. So there's there's always this need to, to collectivize, to work together. Spaces like this, for example, need to be replicated, no? need, need to be heard at a policy level so that that policy does help enable these aspirations to actually uh, become real, no? uh, but also for, for communities to be given that space to assert themselves and for communities to assert, no? notwithstanding tribulations and challenges. It's actually a tall order and, not an, and a, no easy prescription how to. You got to grit, I suppose. No? Those of us who have worked with communities have um, must grit along with them. So that means, Doty, more spaces like this, uh, Mai said. So <laughs> more organizing from Doty's camp, who has been organizing these panels for six days in a row. Um, but yeah, thank you for that, Mai. Um, Yus? I will skip in a moment because still noise in here. Judy, you're muted. Sorry. So um, in the last few minutes, maybe I can just uh, read through the messages here. And then, Dot, if we can just spend a few more minutes to just ask the, the resource persons for their last uh, messages. Um, but here in the chat box, I would just like to read the comments from our, from our friends. Um, from from che, uh, che, Cheryl Polotan from the Philippines, thank you for the report. It could help us better understand the fallacy of green solutions promoted by the governments but are actually funded by corporations. And then um, from Muriel Orevillo, uh, allowing China and other big capitalist countries to detect rare earth minerals is good only if the governments will truly take the courage not to become a vessel of these countries that have the technology to, de to detect these minerals. We have to change our values and lifestyle that demand so much from Mother Earth. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, if the so-called, still from Muriel, if the so-called progress or development will only destroy Mother Earth more and displace more, uh, will destroy Mother Earth more and displace more people, then I would argue that we go back to our values, live simply and not bother about mining the rare earth or other minerals. Limit our human desire, sometimes greed for the so-called development. And from Maike Hendricks, from um, both ends, thank you for the report. It'll give us ammunition for our advocates. So I hope you got uh, you got the link um, and uh, and spend time to read. Uh, it's a ninety page report, but with good illustrations. So yeah, Anka, maybe we can call on our resource persons for our for the last not the last word, but uh, for now. <laughs> Closing. Yes. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, I hope you find these sessions useful and informative. 
um, of course, uh, do get in touch uh, with us. And, and again, as we mentioned, do, uh, do read the report and the materials that were shared on the chat. Thank you very much to the speakers, the wonderful speakers uh, from across the world, from uh, Asia and, and Europe as well. And as Judy said, we would just like to invite, I know Karina had to leave, but we still have my uh, wit and views just for some final reflections. It can be, you know, just a reflection or, or an invitation to action, to solidarity or things we can do together. Uh, should I start with the uh, views? Or it's still noisy at your end? Yes, okay, already. I think it's more or less noise now. Okay. Yeah, uh, responding to the Ma uh, Mariana question, what is the immediate uh, steps that can be done uh, because the circular economy, uh, maybe community cannot wait. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, what we can done is to urge uh, all government, in, including Indonesia and also in Europe, to apply the best uh standard uh, on the environment practices like uh, uh, protection the area of the indigenous community like uh, no go zone for the indigenous uh, community who we that live in that area and also uh, europe the uh, europe uh, put uh, levy anti-dumping for Indonesia nickel because it is too cheap for Europe uh, market another producer so Indonesia need to uh, the product from Indonesia uh, put levy but uh, this levy uh, does not reflect the cost of uh, environment the cheap cost of uh, uh, cheap cost of labor. So uh, this uh, uh, levy should also return back for the environment protection and for the raising uh, welfare of the workers. So these instruments, uh, the the uh, yeah, not very ideal instrument, but uh, this can be done in order to uh, uh, avoid uh, even extension to the indigenous uh, people or the uh, local community. So the best available standard, the, whether regulation or uh, non-state uh, standard uh, should be used uh, in the moment before we fully move into the circular economy. Over to you, Anka. Thank you very much, Pius. And thank you for bringing the, the welfare of the, the workers as well. This is something that uh, we need to, uh, to be aware of. I will just, I'm conscious of time and we are supposed to finish at one. We will just, if you can stay with us for a couple more minutes. And I will hand over to Mai and then uh, to Wit to, to close. Uh, thank you. I will attempt now to have my uh, camera open. So I think in 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 some um, this forum has alerted that you know, that uh, it of green extractivism how the transition has been premised that uh, to the clean energy transition to be mineral uh, intensive. It is a worrisome projection. Actually, it is problematic in terms of scale. So we need to w watch out for policies that are actually green extractivism. We have been alerted to greenwashing. Uh, it will also take some sensitive navigation among us advocates that we are not um, sucked into disingenuous discoursing, you know, pitting renewable energy with mining. Uh, ultimately, the question is, does this climate resilience and some of these institutions have been wont to use you know, fall within the parameters, uh, notions of just transition? Uh, of the scale that I would belabor this now that is attuned to local needs and ecologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Wit. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to the report, but also the kind of last word in a way. Um, and I guess the last word for me, I mean, very briefly, two quick things. One, you know, I, I really think we've got this great opportunity to, to, to talk together about the circular society. I mean, at a very 
quick example of how you know you'll talk about circular society more than circular economy is i mentioned earlier about battery technology changing so that you have um iron phosphate batteries coming on they're massively cheaper than nickel and cobalt what's interesting is now they're saying well in that case we're going to struggle to recycle batteries because the cost isn't there the point is it's not about trying to save the cost the point is it's about saving the materials that go into those batteries I think that's the sort of challenge that we have. Um, and, you know, there's battery regulations being discussed in Europe at the moment. We can input to that. So, you know, I think there are different vantage points we need to 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 be able to lobby on. But those are clearly um, opportunities for us as long as we have the right direction. As long as we're coming from the right angle. Um, so, I would certainly we're working out where this work is going to go in the future. So, I would really encourage those of you here to join us in thinking through that and working through that. I think importantly, you know, the Asia Europe People's Forum, there are people on this call who were part of the meeting two years ago in Ghent, um, and even back four years ago in Mongolia. So it, there's this continuity to be having these discussions. And, and I love having these discussions amongst us. And I've learned new things and so much more from this particular session. But I think, you know, we, we can move forward together and make with the, uh, the um, circle that's working on climate change and the ones that are working on food sovereignty because there are links there. So I think you know, we, we can use this space to talk amongst ourselves and to be able to move some of that, that joint messaging forward, but also bringing in some of the other circles and making sure we're reaching out to our partners and our friends who have other thematic concerns so that they understand how we can deal with whole material transition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Whip. Thank you, Mai. Thank you, Fius. And thank you, Karina and Ankai. Thank you, everyone who have stayed on. Um, we can. Uh, this is recorded, and we will be posting this session in the uh, in YouTube and the in the Facebook page of AEPF. Um, Anka, this is such a very insightful uh, for me, no. And for me, my takeaway are the main words are just transition. We cannot just go into transition, as the report says, keeping the structure and scale of our current fossil fuel economy only powered by renewals. The issue is the demand, and it has always been, no? For the vision, for me, the vision is when vivir, uh, as Whit mentioned, no? the good life. It's not about consuming because we can afford to. It's about consuming just enough. That means less extraction of materials and energy use means less destruction, less waste, means more to share and to go around for everyone. This means also less extractivist violence and more space for everyone to contribute to better, just, and more humane future. And so it goes back to critically looking at our development framework and the role of corporations and high-income nations and its impact to societies, people, and communities who are living in the margins and or further pushed further into the margins because of these extractions. And the second takeaway for me from this is the need to think together and work together. Um, everything is connected to each other, interrelated. Ang lahat ng bagay ay magkakaugnay, sabi in Filipino. So we want to have, again, the report says, chains of solidarity to be able to affect structural systems change. We want to veer away from dirty energy, but we need to support anti-mining campaigns as we should steer clear from more resource extens extensive transition pro process. When we smash corporate power, that should go hand in hand with our struggle to smash patriarchy. We want to promote circular economy, then at its core should be the recognition and respect of ancestral domains and traditional territories. So especially today, in this time of pandemic, we need to build circular economy towards nurturing just equal societies. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying on. Just one final point. Thank you very much, Judy. It was really nice to share the, the space with you. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And just to complement what you were saying, I think also when we build a vision is to listen to the communities who are on the front line and, and to build that uh, based on, on uh, their imaginations as well. And I just want to final thank to Dottie, who has been a, a rock star over these days because she has been bringing us together. She has taken the time also to support us with the tech today. And she has been, you know, uh, um, so... Um, 
involved in in this for the last five uh, six days so yeah thank you very much Dottie, and thank you everyone the speakers for for joining us thank you Omar. thank you to our moderators and the organizers yeah. you were lovely <laughs> thank you thank you very much